Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Enjoying the nice weather? I, I know pretty soon we need to start praying for rain, though. I, I suspect. I'm, I'm kind of looking. Yep, I see. I see heads nodding and and everything like that. Well, uh, so uh, so enjoy the nice weather. Uh, but at the same time, we'll we'll uh, we'll also hope for. I think there's rain in the forecast for next weekend. So um, uh, don't worry if it messes up your plans. Uh, the farmers need it, and and we'll stay balanced like that. But we have a wonderful service for you this morning on this gorgeous uh, summer. It's not even technically summer, but uh, this wonderful June Sunday. We have communion. We have uh, friends with us. Uh, I, you know, it's just it's amazing. What a wonderful day! And uh, welcome to all of those of you at home as well. And um, hopefully there aren't any problems. We had a little. We had a few. Um, uh, issues this morning. I think everything's good. All right. Everything is good. Let us begin our worship this morning with some music from uh, from our organist. All right. I would like to invite the kids to come up for a special time. Hi. I know we have two. That's exciting, isn't it? It's so exciting to see you guys. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but when, when we start the worship service, I always go up there and I light candles. You ever notice me doing that? Yep, and I used to use this candle lighter and so you pull the, tr you have to pull the trigger and then it makes, it makes a flame, makes fire. And then I use that fire to, to make fire on the candles, right? This is a candle here, so basically, do like that and then it lights the candles easy right fire makes fire but now i'm using this one and watch this no fire it's like a spark isn't it so do you think that this can light the the candle i mean it's not fire it's just a spark you think it will? What do you think? I got one yes and one no. So let's put it to the test here. How did that work? It is. It's like a laser. It's like a spark in there, isn't it? I'm going to blow this out so that we're safe. We always want to be really, really super safe around. We never want to play with matches or, or fire, right? Yeah. Okay. That's well, we let mom and dad do it at home, right? Any adult. And if you ever see the old firefighter in me wants to say, if you ever see matches laying around, you, you let your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or another adult know, right? All right. It's not even October and you get your, um, you get your fire safety. Well, so how do you think it is that, that this spark can light the candle just as well as fire does? I know that. Well, they both worked, didn't they? They both lit the candle. Well, it is a spark. It's not really a laser, but it's electricity that goes between there. This is rechargeable. I plug it in kind of like you do your phones. And um, uh, I don't think I have too many. Yep, I only have one one little thing. I've got to I've got to plug it in. Um, but it makes electricity and the electricity goes through there. And you know what this reminded me of? This reminded me of what Jesus has given us to enable us to do stuff. You see, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so wherever Jesus went, he lit the lights for other people by sharing God's love and all the good news about God and how much God loves us and how we can be forgiven because of God's love. But we're a little bit more like this one. We don't have a flame like Jesus does. 
But yet Jesus said, we are the light of the world too. And he said that because Jesus knew that he was going to send the Holy Spirit and also that he would walk with us and he would make it possible, even though we might not have a, a light like he does, we can still light up other people and be the light of the world because that electricity like goes through here that's what we get from jesus that's what he enables us to do whenever jesus asks us to do something he gives us the power just like that electricity to do whatever it is isn't that exciting yeah. this doesn't look like it can do much does it no but because it's got that electricity it can light the candle and because we have Jesus in our lives, we can do whatever we have to do as well. Yeah. So let's pray and thank God for sending Jesus. And let's also thank Jesus for being with us and making it possible for us to be the light of the world and do anything that Jesus calls us to do. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you have created us as your children. And thank you that you sent Jesus into the world so that not only could he tell us and show us how to help other people and share about your love, but when he went back up to heaven, he could be with us in our hearts and give us that electricity, that spark to be able to continue lighting up people's lives, sharing the good news about your love for them and for us and for making our world a better place. It really is true, God. Through Jesus, we can do all things. I pray that you would remind these two young ladies of that all of their lives. And most importantly, I pray that you would remind them just how much you love them, because that's the most important thing to know of all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How about a sucker? You haven't had a sucker in a while, have you? Yeah, great to see you guys. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is Psalm 8. Our Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands, you have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, how sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. You know, I know that um, in the in the temple time uh, back in uh, Jerusalem, um, they used to sing the Psalms in some places still do. But boy, doesn't that make you want to break into song? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That is a that is a song. Um, thank you so much, Lori. Our second scripture today, uh, we turn to Matthew's gospel. We fast forwarded just a touch from our uh, Pentecost event last Sunday. And now we see Jesus leaving his disciples and putting them in charge, just as Lori read about God giving uh, humanity a uh, charge over the earth. So Jesus gives his followers charge over the church. We find it in the 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20. And this is what Matthew records. He says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, we do give you thanks. If we really think about it, we're blown away that you call us your people, let alone regarding us as your children. God, your word is filled with your love for us. It has rightly been called a love letter. And so show us your message in this familiar scripture on this Sunday morning. Guide our feet and lift our hearts and show us the way forward that you have created each of us for. Amen. I have a question for you this morning. I'm going to warn you, it's not necessarily an easy question, but it's an important question. So are you ready? Everybody had enough coffee? All right. What is the best thing to say to somebody who is hurting or grieving or in some way having a tough time or a challenge in life? What do we say to them? What is, what is the best thing to say? I told you that's not an easy question. Anyone who took part in the adult Sunday school class might have a little bit of a leg up because we talked about the book of Job and we talked about, actually, we spent a lot of time talking about what not to say. Um, if you read the book of Job and read all of that um, his friends shared with him, that's pretty much a good thesis on what not to say to someone who is having a tough time. But it doesn't really ever address what we should say, although we talked about it in the class. So what do you think? What is the best thing that we can possibly say to someone who is grieving or suffering or just overwhelmed in general by everything that's going on in life? You can say, I'm sorry. Can I help you? That's very good. Those are all great things to say. And it, we need to know what this is, don't we? Because we are going to be faced with these circumstances. We, we can't be like the ostrich and stick our head in the sand and hope that it'll just go away. Because the reality is we have a tough world. And if we have relationships with people, we're going to know people who go through difficult times. Perhaps you've gone through some of those tough times yourself. Perhaps you, like Job, can recall things that were helpful and were not so helpful. Well, I'm going to fill in any gaps. In case you're not sure, the suggestions we have are excellent. But I'm going to give you the best thing that you can say to someone who is having a tough time. Are you ready? Nothing. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Nothing is the best thing, the best thing that we can say to somebody who's grieving or suffering or struggling or overwhelmed. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that we do nothing. It just means that we don't necessarily need to say anything at all. See the difference there? Because the reality is, is that there's nothing we're going to say that's really going to make a difference. I'm sorry, how can I help? Those are up there right below nothing. If you're going to say something at all, say that. Please don't start a sentence with, well, at least. I literally warn families who are grieving about at least sentences because seldom does anything helpful come after the words at least. But the most important thing, if someone is grieving or suffering or struggling in any way, most important thing of all is not what comes from our lips, it's what we do. Just being with someone is the most important thing that you can do. A hug truly says more than any words in the English dictionary or any other dictionary for that matter. Sometimes we get so concerned about what we've got to say. We want to have the right words. We don't want to say the wrong thing. Well, I'm giving you permission this morning to do the best thing, which is to simply be there. And just in case you're wondering what kind of a difference this can make, let me tell you a personal story out of my own life. One of the worst and most difficult times that I've ever gone through is when my sister died. Turns out she had a, uh, a heart issue that none of us knew about. So she fell asleep Monday night watching Monday night football. And the next morning, her daughter couldn't wake her up to make their lunches. It was just that. She was just gone. 
So as I'm coming back from Connecticut, which is where I was living at the time, trying to wrap my brain around the last time I'd spoken with my sister, and if I had told her that I loved her or not, we go through all of the processes. We get to the visitation, and it is wall-to-wall -wall people, as is often the case when someone so young dies and four kids, and they literally brought buses of the kids from the, from the schools to be there for uh, my, nieces, my niece and nephews. And I went outside because I just got to this point where I couldn't be inside anymore. I just needed a breather. And all of a sudden, I looked up and walking down the sidewalk toward the door of the funeral home was a woman named Liz from my church in Connecticut. She had flown all the way to Ohio just to be with me. And I remember exactly what she said. She said, I thought you might need a hug. That was it. And if you're wondering what kind of a difference that made in my life, let me tell you, I do not remember anything that anyone said that day or the other day, uh, the funeral. I don't even remember what I said and I co-officiated the funeral service. I apparently didn't even know that the boyfriend that I had all the way through high school was there because I introduced myself to him and thanked him for coming. Situations like that overwhelm us. We don't remember those things, but let me promise you something. I will never ever to my dying day forget what Liz did. I will never forget that she came there and she was simply with me. That hug meant more than all of the words that I had heard all the way leading up to and to this day since. That's the most important thing we can do. It's not about words. It's about what we do. It's about our presence. And now I, I wish that I could tell you that I've learned this from some really studious program, that it was at uh, Gordon Conwell Seminary or New York Theological Seminary that I learned this wonderful insight about the power of presence, the power of just simply being there with someone and not worrying about saying anything necessarily at all. Recognizing that words are inadequate and that even if I could explain to you why something had happened, it wouldn't matter because it had still happened. But just being there and giving someone a hug, letting them know that they're not alone in the midst of their darkest time, in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of being overwhelmed. I learned about this power of presence, not simply from my own experiences, but rather from Jesus. And I don't say that as like a minister. Well, everything's supposed to, you know, sometimes the kids are up here and I don't know if you've ever noticed if I ask them a question, uh, the Doster boys have, have tuned into this. If the pastor asks you the question, chances are the answer is Jesus. Just say Jesus, you can't go wrong. And it's always hard for me to say, well, actually the answer, you know, that's a good answer, but but, but that's not what I'm doing. It's not like, well, the answer is always Jesus. No, but Jesus was always there with people. We have recorded in the Bible many of the things that he said. We still record, we still celebrate them and learn from them today. But the most important thing that he ever did was to simply be there with people. And in fact, that's what today's scripture is all about. Today's scripture is not only a reminder of the power of presence, it's a promise of Jesus's presence with us. Now, I am well aware that most other churches that you could have gone to today, or if you go someplace else after this, if you really love just going to church or tune into something later, no judgment if you just really like going to churches. Um, but most pastors will preach the scripture that I read for you today um, as the Great Commission, because that's what we know it as. Jesus' call to all of us to essentially continue his mission in our world, to continue sharing the good news of God's love and grace, to go and tell as the scripture records. And in fact, I learned something interesting this week. The go doesn't even mean go as a missionary necessarily. In the Greek, it's a passive form of the word. So it means as you're going through life, share everything that I taught you. And yet, that's not what I want to focus on today, because as important as that is, it's literally the foundation of what we're called to be as Christians. But I think that there's something that's got to come before that. You see, if I was just to stand up here and preach about the Great Commission, 
Many of you might be sitting there and thinking, well, that sounds great, but I can't do that. I haven't gone to church enough. I don't know the Bible well enough. I don't even have a regular prayer life. I, I can't possibly do what Jesus is calling me to do, except that you can. Because as I told the kids, anything Jesus calls us to do, we can do. We just need to know how to do it. And that's why I wanted to talk about the power of presence first and foremost. Because Jesus didn't stop when he said, go therefore into all the earth and teach and baptize and share. Then he concluded by saying, and remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, which means to the end of eternity, the end of everything. Jesus has promised to always be there with us. We can't even wrap our minds around what that means, and yet he's going to be there with us throughout it all. Because he knows. He knows that we doubt ourselves. You heard me read that some of the disciples doubted even as they showed up, even after everything that they had seen. And he knew that on our own, we are not capable of doing all that he calls us to do. He knows that even with the Holy Spirit, we're going to have moments when we falter, moments when we feel like we're not enough, that we're not adequate. And so he reminds us that we're not alone, that we don't have to do it on our own, because he's with us always, walking with us, guiding us. Now, of course, we've got to listen to him. You know, it can't be like kids when their mother tells them the best thing to do or their father, and they go ahead and do their own thing anyway and wonder why they get into trouble. We've got to listen, but he's always there. This isn't just a reminder, it's a promise that we have from Jesus. And this is how we can do whatever he calls us to do. You've heard the saying that there's strength in numbers. It's exactly what this promise is about. It's about no matter how much this world values the individual over the group, no matter how alone we may at sometimes feel, that we don't have to do it on our own. We're never left to our own vices. We do have a power that's beyond us, whether it's for guidance, for inspiration, or for strength. Those of you who know me know that my favorite verse in the entire Bible is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you walk into my office, it's not much of a secret because I have many wonderful gifts that say that throughout my office. And think about what that says. I can do all things. Yes, that's exactly what Jesus says. How? Through Christ. This promise right here is what Paul knew when he penned those words to the Philippian Christians. He knew that anything we're called to do, we can do, but we can't do it on our own. We do it through Christ. Why? Because he gives us his strength. That same strength that raised Lazarus from the dead, that same strength that healed lepers, that same strength that enabled him to literally rise from the dead himself, to teach all that he did, to put up with all of the pressures, all of the torment, from the religious leaders. Everything that Jesus did, he did through his strength, through the Holy Spirit, through everything that God had given him. And now, all of that, that whole resource package, he's giving to us. When he says, I am with you, this is not like us saying, you know, well, I wish I could be at the party, but I'll be there in spirit. No, I realize Jesus is spirit now as he lives in heaven, which is a spiritual realm. But he's not saying to us, I'll be with you in spirit. I'll be praying for you as you go through and fulfill this commission. Uh-uh. No, I will be with you. I, I love, there, there was a, a joke that I read years ago about this little kid and he was going for a, uh, a checkup. And so, as is often the case, he had to strip down to his little underwear and everything, and he had Spider-Man on his underwear. And um, the doctor pointed out, just trying to make conversation with the kid, put him at ease, and he's like, oh, you've got Spider-Man on your underwear. And the kid spoke up and he goes, yep, I've got Spider-Man on my underwear and I've got Jesus in my heart. I think that was a little more than the doctor planned for, but how wonderful is that? When they talk about from the mouths of babes, Right, we should all be walking around, not necessarily with Spider-Man underwear. And if you have Spider-Man underwear, I don't wanna know about it. But I do hope that you have Jesus in your heart because that's where he has promised to be. In fact, the reality is he's already there. 
whether you're tapping into that or not. And here's the best part. Jesus is with us not only as we seek to follow in his footsteps, as we endeavor to continue his mission in the world and fulfill this great commission as we go through our lives to share the good news of God's love and grace. It's not only then that Jesus is with us and strengthening us and guiding us and encouraging us and supporting us. It's in every aspect of our lives. Jesus knows how tough this world is. He lived it. He's been there. He's done that. And that's why he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Whatever we're going through, there is nothing that can truly overwhelm us. There is nothing that can ever get the best of us. There is nothing, no situation in which we are ever alone because Jesus is there with us always encouraging us, guiding us, and strengthening us to do all things, whether it's for the church and his mission, or for our own lives, our friends, our family, whomever we're called to minister to and to care for, even if it's not a spiritual or religious type of thing. Jesus wasn't necessarily spiritual or religious if you read about it. He was like us. He was a person. His spirit was inside, it guided everything that he did. And now we have his spirit in ours, along with the Holy Spirit, which empowers us. We have Jesus strengthening us, showing us the way. This is the promise that we have in the scriptures. This is what able, enables us to do all things, including fulfilling the Great Commission. And this is why I wanted to share this with you today, because the power of presence that we can experience with Jesus is then what we can share with the world. And let me tell you, the reason that I started out with that question is because there are more people than you would ever know who are hurting, who are struggling. I often know many things as a pastor that I am not privileged to tell because I keep privacies very near and dear. But trust me when I tell you there are many people within our church and within our community who are in crisis right now. And they just need to know somebody cares. We don't have to say the right thing. We just need to be willing to be there for them. And if we can't be there in person, then we can lift them up in prayer and be with them there in spirit, in the real way of being there in spirit. And we can do it all because Jesus is with us, just as he's with them. And he will always be with us. So let's not worry about what the world throws at us. Let's remember that no matter how big our problems are, our God and what Jesus gives us is so much bigger than all of that. Let us remember that he is with us always. Let us never forget that we can do all things for the church and within our own lives, but we can do them through Christ, through Jesus, with us and strengthening us until the end of the age. Amen. And now as we leave this place, I pray that we do so with a new pep in our step, knowing that we are never alone, knowing that the burdens are not ours to bear alone, but that Jesus is with us. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit and called by God, and we truly can do all things through Jesus, who gives us the strength, the courage, and the hope this day and all days. Amen.